Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, keep goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 324 with Mike Vardy. Mike is an author, speaker, and productivity and time management strategist. He's the founder of Productivityist, and the company's mission is to help people stop doing productive and start being productive through a variety of online and offline courses. He's the author of The Front Nine, How to Start the Year You Want Anytime You Want, and most recently, The Productivityist Playbook. He has served in an editorial capacity for The Next Web and is a contributor to The Huffington Post, GTD Times, 99U, Lifehacker, and Success Magazine. Expect to learn a number of techniques that you can begin to apply today to see an immediate impact on your own productivity, including one, how to avoid the hefty cost of task switching by batching tasks on your calendar, two, why frameworks give you freedom, and three, techniques for letting technology be your slave rather than your master. With that, enjoy my conversation with the productivityist, Mike Vardy. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me, Steve. Really appreciate you having me here. It's an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Um, I did get to chat with yourself a couple months ago when I was on your show, so uh, it was only fitting that I had you on mine. And uh, I mean, you're joining us all the way from British Columbia in Canada. I imagine it's uh, quite cold over there at the moment. Okay, so this is a bias that we can get out of the way right away because I'd love to talk about biases at some point, but it's not that cold here. Okay. We're in the. It, it's funny. Well, what, 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 what is not that cold to you? What what sort of how okay. many degrees Celsius are we talking here? <laughs> okay, so it's pro- like I mean, for us right now, it's probably about seven. <laughs> That's Celsius. pretty cool. I guess it's all relative, right? I mean, Melbourne, it's, Australia, it's really, you know, our right. average winter weather is maybe like 15 degrees Celsius. So it's not like, right. Yeah. It's, but, but relative to Canada, the rest of Canada, like we don't get snow here. And when we do, mm-hmm. so I can't say we don't get it, but when it happens, the whole place shuts down. I actually had to, I was just at a conference not too long ago and m- the flying in and out of the Pacific Northwest was a nightmare because Seattle was snowed in. They're not yeah. used to it. Victoria, Vancouver, we're in that like kind of area. So when people think, oh, Canada must be cold, relatively speaking, depending on where you are, yes, but not all of Canada is buried in snow and most most of Canada knows how to deal with it, not where I live. It's, <laughs> well, it's, quite, it's quite hilarious. It's kind of like uh, people's perceptions of Australia. They just think we've got kangaroos jumping around our backyards and poisonous spiders all over the place and you've got to check your shoes before you put them on <laughs> and things like that. And yeah, you know, that is so far and, from and the you truth. you only put shrimp on barbecues oh, and everyone yeah. drinks Fosters and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. pretty much, pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to digging in today because, um, as you know, I published an article recently called The Case for the Six-Hour Workday, and I know you are all about productivity. But um, just to give our audience a better view for who you are, I mean, if you were to go to a cocktail party tonight and it was full of strangers and people came up to you and asked you that good old question, what do you do? How do you respond? I help people manage their time and their attention and focus. Fantastic. And then, then it expands upon that. Because when I say I'm a productivity strategist, they no one knows what that means. Mm-hmm. So I generally – actually, often what I'll say is I'm an entrepreneur initially because at least people know what that is. But when you get down to it, my job is to help people kind of marry their intentions, what they really need and want to do with attention. How are they going to pay attention to that? And that's what I help people with through my podcast, through coaching. Uh, we're launching a membership site now. So I'm going to be able to do that on an ongoing basis. Uh, all of those things. And I've been doing it for the better part of a decade. Fantastic. And um, I mean, this is perhaps something that a lot of people don't really think about. I mean, you might get some soft skills training in a big corporate around time management for half a day or something to that effect, um, usually employing some old school tactics. And I feel like a lot of people have never really learned 
how to work. So in your case, I mean, having been in this space for a decade, what got you into it in the first place? So it was that very thing, the idea that I had no real sense of how to manage my time and attention and, and figure out how I was going to, you know, have all of these th aspects of my life kind of uh, coalesce in harmony. I mean, I was working for Costco. I was a manager running two different departments in the in the building, one at the front, one at the back. One was more of an impulse on demand uh, department, which is the food court where you'd go and you buy the hot dog and pop and you'd sit down. It was kind mm -hmm. of the last line of defense. And then there's the service deli area where the rotisserie chickens are sold and all of the the prepared meals that you had to schedule and you had to time them so that you know new ones were coming on to the shelves as the old ones were getting close mm -hmm. to expiry and things like that so very different modalities there plus you know I I'm I was dating so I was I, you know I just moved to this part of the part of the world and I was dating my wife so I was trying to balance that and mm -hmm. then you know uh, all of a sudden uh, one of my colleagues who was my roommate at the time said you know hey you should go to this improv class because I know that you've got a comedy background and I did and uh, that was the beginning of my sojourn into comedy which then all of a sudden I'm now trying to balance that and so I'm sitting there going how am I going to balance all these things and do all of them reasonably well huh. and that's when I started to study the the work of initially it was Stephen Covey and even Tony Robbins actually I could tell you it was I was sitting up late at night because I'm a night owl and uh, an infomercial for Get the Edge came on, Tony Robbins' second program that he kind of is known for, not Personal Power, but the other one. And there was an element on time and I'm like, you know, I should buy that program. And it was, I think, what, 300 bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I bought it and I'm like, oh, this is this is exactly what I need. And then I studied Covey and then ultimately David Allen and his Getting Things Done methodology. Yep. And slowly but surely, I started to find that I didn't want to be doing Costco as much anymore, at least not the management part. So I needed to have that that income coming in so I could start to build up my comedy career. So I stepped down from the 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 high level management area where I felt kind of trapped to the part time guy at the door greeting people and clicking, you know, the clicker and highlighting mm -hmm. their receipts as they go up because then I had control. I was part time and I could use the off hours to work on my budding comedy career, which was largely around doing sketch comedy and improv, but also online. I started to do a productivity parody site because this was the time that Lifehacker was, all, you know, starting to come into its own. And mm -hmm. a lot of these different productivity, what they would call productivity porn sites, which is, you know, like, hey, how do you how do you uh, <laughs> how do you keep the bottom of your bun from getting soggy on a hamburger? Put, put a slice of lettuce underneath there. There's a life hack. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. So I started to do the Stephen Colbert-esque take on this. And it was called eventualism. And I started to play that role. And then I interviewed people like Seth Godin. I mm -hmm. reached out to him. And I reached out to a bunch of other people, including David Allen. And after I interviewed David Allen for my podcast, his people said, hey, you should write for the Getting Things Done Times, their online blog. I did. And uh, they said, you know, tone down the, the personality and, and make it <laughs> funny. And, and But don't be like this parody guy. Be yourself. And lo and behold, that started me further down the path to becoming the very thing I was parodying, which was a productivity expert, a strategist, specialist. But now I, I would say I'm a strategist for sure. And, you know, I've even had some people say, well, now you're more into the philosophical components of it. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm a productivity philosopher now. I don't mm -hmm. know. But then then I started to write for Lifehack and Work Awesome and all these other sites. And ultimately, uh, I decided to go off on my own and start Productivityist. And uh, that's where we're at today. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, With respect to your comedy and improv career, I mean, are you still doing that kind of stuff or... You know, I don't really do it outside of the fact that I get to perform on stage when I do talks related to productivity. And one mm. of the things that, that I love about what I can bring to the table is that this topic is not exactly the most, um, shall we say, uh, entertaining of, of topics. You, it's hard. It's a very dry topic, time management and productivity. And so I try to bring that element of humor to the table because it's disarming, especially when I'm trying to change the mindset of people when it comes to, to time management management and and productivity so I, the, the idea they get to the podcast that i get to do videos for youtube that i'm doing mm -hmm. stuff on instagram i still get to quote perform and some of this is improvised like my daily podcast three minutes of time crafting i take a t I, I basically get what they would call an improv and ask for and then i just riff on that for three minutes kind of like i would do uh, you know in an improv bit and then you know other things are more scripted but i get to do all that and and frankly um, this may not be well known, but to 
be a uh, comedian on a small island in Canada is not exactly the uh, easiest way to make a living. So I tend to do a no. little bit better now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny what you say there. I mean, I did dabble in, in the world of stand-up comedy last year and did a couple of online courses. I think it was a Steve um, Martin masterclass. and then oh, the I went out, class. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. But yeah. then I went out on the open mic circuit and you know, got some laughs, got a lot of blank faces as well. Um, but what I did find was that I was able to take some of these techniques and put them back into my uh, keynotes and, and make them more mm -hmm. interesting because let's face it, I mean, keynotes on business and entrepreneurship on innovation usually are quite dry, but just by using some of those uh, techniques, for example, setting up an assumption and then shattering it, um, that can just go a long way. It's such a simple tweak, but it just gives the audience something that they're not expecting. So it is about uh, incorporating lessons and skills from different fields and applying them in ways that you probably perhaps didn't think was possible. And I guess that's creativity at its core. But um, I mean, when, you're, when you are on stage, I guess that is one place where you really need to get into flow, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. And you could actually, it's funny. Um, I just, that, that conference that I just did where, you know, the planes almost didn't leave here. I ended up doing, uh, I was talking about the idea of some of the biases we talked about earlier mm -hmm. on how, you know, Canada, snow, all that stuff. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll tell you another fact about Canada. Cause now when someone hears that, Oh, wait a minute, not all of Canada is snowy in winter. Well, what else do I think about Canada that might not be true? Mm -hmm. And I, and I said, like, did you realize that in Canada, you cannot order a burger in any other form other than well done? And the, the, the look, I was in America and a lot of the people's looks on their face are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, it's actually a law that you get, your burgers must be cooked well done. And mm -hmm. there was a Canadian that was on before me, Humble the Poet, who spoke at the event. He's involved with like some of, uh, Lily Singh, who's super one on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I saw him spoke. He's from, speak, he's from Toronto. And I said, tr listen, trust me. I said, Humble. And I looked at him and I said, he was in the crowd and I said, have you ever had a medium rare burger in Canada? And he he belted out, well, I'm a vegetarian. And I'm like, you see, he's never had a medium rare burger in Canada. And it was <laughs> the, the, the audience. Now, see, if I didn't have that improv background, I'm, that might've been a full stop there for yeah. a second. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I think like, you're right. The ability to play and be in flow, it's helpful. And again, that humor is really disarming. I think that when you can do like the pattern breaks and, and the callbacks and things like that, mm -hmm. it can really it can really engage your audience to the point where it doesn't feel like they're necessarily um, learn. I wouldn't say learning, but they 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 don't feel like they're being spoken to. They feel like they're involved in a show in a performance, mm -hmm. yeah, and and I, and I like that. Yeah, they feel like they're being entertained essentially, rather than at yeah. some mandatory training session just to get their continuous professional, you know points or whatnot in, in a large company in, in many cases. But um, before we go any further, given that you run a company called Productivityist, I'd like to know what your definition of productivity is, Mike. So my definition of productivity is different than I think uh, what a lot of other people in the space would, would say, at mm -hmm. least uh, up front. So let me tell you what I don't think it is mm -hmm. first. I don't think it's efficiency and effectiveness for the sake of that. I yeah. think that those things come eventually. I think my, my definition is it's intention, what do you need and want to do, married with attention. How are you going to pay attention to it? Mm -hmm. You marry those things together, that's productivity. And more, more to the point, it's actually personal productivity. Now, personal can be for a company or for an individual. But then once you get those lined up, then the speed comes, then the effectiveness mm -hmm. comes. Because you can be efficient about the wrong things and you can be effective about the wrong oh, things. Oh, yeah. And right. I think so, uh, that's uh, something Peter Drucker said, you know, productivity is yep. essentially what you don't do. Um, and a lot of people think it's just about being efficient at what ends up being the wrong thing. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that the reason that that is becoming more prevalent today is we mm -hmm. live in such a culture of speed and demand and and interruption and disruption yeah. that it's just the easy way out. Let's do as much as we can in as quick a time as we can, and that's productivity. But that's really more – in a lot of cases, it's – busy work disguised as productivity. Mm, yeah. And I'm glad that you said um, intention and attention because I think it actually reminds me of something Adam Grant said in a LinkedIn post recently where he said, rather than managing time, we should be managing attention because the world mm -hmm. has moved on from say algorithmic tasks, where it's all about how many widgets you can put in a box in eight hours. It's more about thinking and heuristic tasks and such tasks. I mean, the, the research on flow uh, where we are essentially our best and totally immersed in one task suggests we can only really get into that space for four or five hours a day. So we should be managing attention and, and focus rather than how many hours you're sitting at your desk. 
Absolutely. Actually, Seth Godin wrote about this today as we're recording this. He mm-hmm. wrote, uh, it was yesterday. Sorry. He did a whole post on lessons for telling time. And one of the things he talked about is he talked about we focus on the days making short term decisions instead of being cognizant of the years. You know, it, it, it's really, really interesting. We put a stopwatch on our best experiences, tick tocking the moments instead of living in them. We tend to do that. And I think you're right when it comes to flow, which is why I've like kind of put it, this this model of time crafting and one element of it, which is like time theming and daily theming and all that stuff Mm -hmm. is I I then have a better chance of making the right decision on what to do at very specific times based on information that I was able to kind of assimilate and, and, and work with prior to that moment. Like, so for example, today as we're recording this, this is what I call my listening day. So when you and I were booking time, I didn't say to you, Uh, You know, I didn't give you a random time, nor did you. We actually somehow filtered to this day. It might have been me that did this, but that would not be an accident. It would be like, this is the day where I focus on listening. And audio is a form of listening. Podcast is a form of listening. So it eliminates some of that decision fatigue, which is the enemy of flow, right? Like if you, if that's a friction point. So for me to have these themes and be able to put these tasks inside of these themes or these buckets, allow me to make better decision and make uh, stay in flow longer because instead of me working necessarily by project or maybe sequentially, I can say, oh, I'm now sitting, you know, uh, it, it's now my low energy time because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's early in the day. What are all the tasks that I've identified in the past as low energy that are on my list now? Let me work on those. And then later on today, I'll work on my high energy ones because that's when I'm at my best to do those tasks. Yeah, I think that's such a, a profound point because so many people just go about their days at the whim and at the mercy of other people's demands on their time. And, and something I've done as well is, you know, carve out particular uh sections of the day for certain types of tasks and particular days of the week for other types of tasks. And that way, a consequence of that is essentially that you do way less task switching. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you just essentially batch all these activities that if I'm in podcasting, I might do three podcasts in a row because then I'm in a podcast mindset. But if I do a podcast and then try and write a blog for an hour and then go back to a podcast and then host a webinar and then do something else, like my brain is constantly switching. So I'll be absolutely exhausted come say the early afternoon rather than focusing or immersing myself in one type of activity. Well, yeah. And, and you know what drives me nuts is is when people uh, like employees, let's say, mm-hmm. they get assigned something by their superiors and they've already got 14 things assigned to them and the superior <laughs> hasn't given them any kind of, um, you know, they, they've been very vague about it. What you need to do in those situations is instead of going sure thing, say, well, here are the other 13 things you've yeah. given me. Which one is a priority? Because it's really arrogant for you to think that your superior knows everything that they've already given to you. They've got a lot of other things going on. So it's better for you to like do them a favor and say, okay, you know, hey, okay, Steve, thanks for mm-hmm. giving me this task. But you, there's these other ones, which one of these do you want first? Yeah. And then that way there's that communication there, which I think is really important. And honestly, if you're going to spend time in email, that would be the better thing to do instead of just, you know, going doing this call and response, call and respond to the right things. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. I think we, what we don't do is we don't slow down. We don't take the time to slow down so that we can pay attention. All we're doing is, and, and I talk about this a lot, with productivity, if you have intention but without attention, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's powerless, right? Yeah. Because, but if you have attention without intention, it's aimless. So if you're going into your inbox because that's what's got your attention, but you have no idea what you're supposed to do in there, or it's not even the place that you want to be, you're just going to be wandering aimlessly in there mm-hmm. until you find a way to pull yourself out. 100%. Well, that's, I guess it's the equivalent of sitting down to write a 2000 word blog post. And the whole time you're talking to your colleague who's sitting next to you. I mean, after an hour or two, you've probably got 200 words down and they're probably not very good versus carving out some uninterrupted space and time, turning off your notifications, not looking at the internet and just focusing on writing down as many words as possible during that you know, couple of hour period, you're going to get way more done because there is intention and attention. Um, one without the other simply doesn't work. Um, but right, something right. you touched on earlier as well, Mike, that I wanted to double click on was, um, you know, our workplaces are awash with distractions. And 
as a result of that, we're doing a hell of a lot of task switching and, and so sometimes even a micro task switch. For example, I read a report which found that even a one tenth of a second task switch, so that could be looking at your phone that came up with some sort of a notification and going back to your work. Over the course of a day, that can actually result in a 40% productivity decrease, according to one study. Um, but I know you've uh, obviously done a hell of a lot of thinking on multitasking or task switching because you know people say that multitasking doesn't actually exist. It's actually task switching. I mean, what do you advise um, your clients when it comes to doing less task switching. I mean, we've covered batching tasks. What else can people do? Well, I think one of the biggest things you can do, like I mentioned, is is this idea of of having better uh, better anchors so that you can make better decisions around mm-hmm. you know what you need to do. So when these interruptions arise, you're you're not saying, okay, what was I doing again, or where do, where do I go now? Because the default is often email or some other messaging thing, because it will tell you what to do. You go into email, there's something there waiting for you, right? Mm. So, for example, uh, if if we once we're done our call today. I'm not going to say, okay, now what do I do? My brain goes, okay, it's, it's, we're done. What's mm-hmm. next? Well, what day is it? Well, it's Wednesday. What's Wednesday mean? Wednesday's listening day. Okay, what tasks can I do that are related to listening? So even if, let's say you get interrupted at the office and you're working on a, a specific task and you get pulled away for a microsecond or for an hour, when you go back, the question isn't what was I working on? The question should be what day is it or what time is it? What block of time if you're doing it horizontally? How, okay, great. It's this period of time. What is my overarching focus generally supposed to be at this time? And again, it could be really narrow. If mm-hmm. It depends on what you're – again, this is where the personal part comes in. Like for me, I have a, a, a horizontal theme, which is during the times of day called making. So, oh, well, it's, it's making time. Okay, let me look at all the tasks that I've said are oriented to making. And then at that point, you could say, oh, well – which ones have I made? Have I listed as a priority, or which ones have I dated today or earlier? So instead of you going trying to remember what you were working on, give your brain a break and say, "Okay, hold on. This is the time period where I'm supposed to be working on these types of tasks, or this is the day Wednesday. Wednesday's listening. Let me look at that." Or and and a final thing is I I often uh, talk about mode-based work, which is Mm -hmm. there's like five categories of modes, which is theme-based, which I've touched on, resource-based, where are you, who are you with, what do you have at your disposal, energy, how are you feeling, are you full of energy, are you depleted, Uh, activity, what kind of activity you're going to do, reading, writing, studying, blogging, researching, and then time, how much time do I have at my disposal, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. So then instead of saying, you know what, I haven't themed my day or this day has gotten off the rails and I'm going to have to ignore the theme, but I have five minutes, let me look at all the tasks that are going to take me five minutes. Yeah. So it's about just, you know what I mean? It's not about looking for the task. It's about looking for either the theme or the modality because that's going to give you a filtered a list as opposed to the massive list, and that's going to allow you to focus. And then you're going to be able to make every moment matter mm. more. What about a, a prioritized task list, Mike? I know you said it's more about the theme than the task, but one thing I find is if I have, before I left the office on one day, say, written down what I need to work on the next day, prioritized it, and then I've got the top three things that need to get done, and I know roughly how much time I'm going to allocate to those three things so that when I come in the next day, I just hit the ground running rather than kind of scratching my head and wondering, what am I going to do today? And there's just picking the lowest hanging fruit, which is something like, let's check LinkedIn for 20 minutes. And obviously, mm-hmm. that's not going to help me. I mean, what are your thoughts on prioritized tasks? lists versus themes. So I think they can work in tandem. So mm-hmm. for example, you could say that, okay, t- like for example, tomorrow is my learning day. So it's where I either I teach myself, I teach others, I spend time learning. So I could do one of two things. I could either wake up Thursday morning and go, oh, it's learning day. Let me look mm-hmm. at all the tasks that are learning and then prioritize that way. Or I could say from the day before, let's say you're planning the day before, hey, what are the three tasks I need to do no matter what? Oh, these three. Okay. When Then when you're done those three tasks, okay, now what? Well, it's Thursday. Thursday's learning day. What are the learning tasks? Sure. So it can, it, you know what I mean? It can work either way. And and the, the great thing about using themes in that respect is that if you don't get all the learning done on Thursday, and let's face it, themes, is if you look at my themes, and I'll, I'll have a link later that people can look at to see mm-hmm. how this kind of thing is done, it, you should, they should be not only usable at work, but at home. They should, they should be able to transcend both. But not only that, it's not like you're never going to stop learning. It's not like you're never going to stop doing deep work. It's not like you're never not going to have to identify whether you have <laughs> low energy, high energy, five minutes. They're all constants, right? So if you're saying, hey, you know what? I didn't get all my listening done today. 
well, when is the next default date that I should be listening? For me, it would be next Wednesday. If you are an audio engineer, you may not be able to say, hey, I need a listening day for one day of the week. You might have to make it something that you do consistently, or it may not even be a useful theme for you. Yeah. But the point is, is that it gives you a sensible default because what often will people do is that, especially with a prioritized list on its own, is they'll say, oh, I didn't get this stuff done. Let's just move it to tomorrow and the next tomorrow, and the next tomorrow. And then you're chasing things, yeah. and you're kind of trying to force the future. Instead of letting the future unfold in front of you based on a framework that you put in place when you were actually able to think about it and make reasonable choices instead of reckless ones. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of um, frameworks, Mike, I mean, a lot of people listening to this may kind of tense up a little bit when you talk about such rigid frameworks, and they might <laughs> think that it's going to sacrifice their freedom. Uh, what do you say to that? I say that that's a bias showing up like crazy. <laughs> so it's funny because, um, you know, the, the thing is frameworks, I believe, foster freedom. And here's mm -hmm. why. Because it allows your brain to kind of make better decisions around the, the things you actually need to do than to worry about necessarily the appointed time, place, et cetera, that they need to be done during. So, for example, I know by default that on Friday it's my deep work day. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm going to dig into deep work day on Friday, you know what I will not be doing on that day? Having meetings as mm -hmm. a rule. Now there's always exceptions to the rule, but you don't want the exceptions to become the rule. And then if they do become the rule, then you know what's happened? You've chosen the wrong theme for that day. Yeah. You always want to kind of work your work with your certainties. So for example, um, and this is where when people say, oh, it's so rigid, it, mine is rigid only because you've not tried it, number mm -hmm. one. And also, I'm doing every day. I've got horizontal themes. I've been doing this for a decade. If you're starting out, you might just want to theme one day. You might just want to have one category of mode. You might just want to, you know, you might just want to just do mode based work and not even worry about theming. It's that's the great thing about time crafting. I designed it so that it doesn't mean that you have to do it all to be doing it right. You can you get incremental increases in your productivity when you when you start to allocate and, and allow yourself to do bit by bit by bit. And then let's say you use one type of mode. You're like, you know what? This is working well for me. Let me add another one. Or, hey, I've themed my Saturdays because Mike managed to break a pattern in me and realized that I do most of my housework on Saturday anyway. So I'm just going to own it and call it household day. So that way all my tasks that are household gravitate to that day. That's been working. What if I made Monday my optimization day like Mike does? What if I spent Mondays when I'm not in meetings and doing other things if I know that I should be working on tasks that are optimized or admin or whatever. I think that the, the, the tricky part here is that it's simple once you put the framework in place, but it's not easy to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part is you have to break through that mindset of there's no way I can do this. So when someone starts working with me and they say, Hey, I want to, I want to theme all my days. I have a client right now. Who's a, um, he's a, he's actually a, 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 a he's, he's a high profile, um, athletic trainer. And he says, I want to do all the, I want to theme all my days. I'm like, no, no, you can't. <laughs> I go, would you, would you tell someone like me? And we were talking about this before we started recording. Hey, guess what? I want you to work out seven days a week for an hour a day, uh, twice, uh, two, two hours per day, one hour in each increment. Would you tell me today? He goes, no, you'd kill yourself. I'm like, this is exactly what you would do if you did that. Not only that, but you would stop doing it. Like I would stop going to the gym. You mm -hmm. would stop doing this. So I, again, you can craft the framework that you want. That's why it's called time crafting. It's your time. You can mold it. So I wouldn't say that, you know, you have to do it all to be doing it well or correctly. I just say implement little pieces of it yeah. that work for you. Kind of like that Bruce Lee adage, right? Absorb what's useful discard what isn't and add your own. Yeah. It's a little bit like uh, what James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits as well. You know, you've got to pick the right entry point. You don't just say, like you said, two hours of gym a day, because for most people, that's just not sustainable. But if you tell yourself, well, I'm going to start with five minutes a day and then up, you know, move up from there. Maybe the next day it's 10 minutes and maybe over the course of a few weeks, you start going for 30 minutes a day, which is enough for you. It's really about right. determining that rather than just saying, I'm going to go two hours a day and, and I'm going to put in all these frameworks. And then you just feel overwhelmed with, um, with the process and you just give up and entirely rather than putting in place something that works for you. But I couldn't agree more. And, and to quote uh, Jocko Willink, you know, discipline equals freedom. And uh, once you actually yep. have frameworks in place, it does give you a lot of freedom back, whether it's in work, whether it's in finance, whether it's in your personal relationships, whether it's your fitness, but it is about being intentional and upfront and doing something that you can actually sustain. Um, you know, so many people who want to lose weight will just go on some crazy, you know, green juice diet and they'll do that for a month. And yeah, sure enough, they'll lose weight. But can you sustain yourself drinking nothing but these green juices for your entire life? 
Of course not. And so what happens is people will regress and they just go from one extreme to the other and they're like, well, screw this diet. I can't do this anymore. And so they'll just go and gorge on junk food and, and the weight will come back on. So it is about identifying what will work for you. But um, on Fridays being your, your meeting day, Mike, I mean, I have, since I jumped out into the world of entrepreneurship, I've had to become a lot more deliberate about what kind of meetings I take, how long these meetings go for, and what I'm looking to get out of them. Uh, you know, when I first made the leap, I'd schedule one hour meetings by default because that's what I knew in the corporate world. And I feel like this is where so much productivity goes missing in the corporate world is one hour meetings by default to discuss things that perhaps could have done with an email or something, something to that effect. Now with your meetings, I mean, do you have any rules? I imagine you do around what gets a meeting and how long you have a meeting for. Yeah, my meetings generally don't last longer than 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. I try to keep them short, mainly because, uh, again, like you said, there's a lot of uh, busy work that gets thrown in there. A lot of stat. I hate status meetings. I know that there's some um, some methodologies that prefer them. And there's a lot of them. A holacracy is a methodology that you know, basically heavily relies on meetings. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of this stuff can be done inside this where digital tools help like Slack, Asana. I use Asana Mm -hmm. with my team. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't have to be discussed that way. I think for me, most of the meetings that I have that are, that are, you know, kind of deeper will last longer, but they're more, they're, they're more, um, I would say they're more, you know, ideation meetings and we kind of let those go a little bit longer, but by and large, like, and and I, I'm again, very, very protective of my time. Um, I use a a acuity scheduling to book time. So I have very Mm -hmm. specific links. Like if someone wants to meet with me for a coffee, there's only one day that they can really do that. And it's only for a certain period of time and only during certain hours. I don't trust myself to, if someone was to say, if you were to say to me, Hey Mike, can we meet on Friday for a coffee? Um, I'm, I don't trust myself to say no, I would much rather say, uh, yeah, here, just take, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to protect my time, take my link. Now you would, again, you might be the exception because you and I have had a chance to chat, but if it's someone out of the blue that wants to do the whole pick your brain kind of thing, which I'm not against, Mm -hmm. I'm not against that, but it has to be on my terms. Right. And the best part is, is when you use a tool, like say acuity scheduling is, um, you're saying, Hey, here's a link, pick whatever works for you. And, again, this is a nice little bit of bias there, is they look at this and go, wow, look, he's giving me his schedule. He's giving me freedom to choose. No, not really. You're only getting freedom to choose what I've made available, mm-hmm. right? So that's so I, I basically, by creating, again, that kind of limiter around like, okay, my meetings are 25 minutes. My meetings are, you know, 15-minute exploratory calls. You know, my coaching calls are generally an hour. Um, those kind of meetings, I have very specific types of meetings. And anything outside of that, I'm like, do we really even have to have a meeting about this at all? And if not, then why don't we just meet over – over um, you know, just discuss it over Asana in the team conversations area. Or if it's not associated with the task at this point, let's talk about it in Slack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so important to protect your time with everything you have, particularly if you are an entrepreneur with limited resources, limited runway. Uh, I mean, nowadays when we have inbound leads and it's with someone, I absolutely have no idea about, uh, who they are, where they're from, nothing. What I do is I send them to a, literally a five minute, uh, you know, acuity calendar link. Um, and that's enough. That's enough in most cases to just ask some simple questions, qualify whether or not there is a legitimate opportunity there or not, and move on. Whereas previously, I'd be like, oh, wow, this, this company is interested in working with us. Let's schedule an hour and let's schedule it at their office. So I have to spend 15 minutes either side of that meeting traveling, and that would eat up 90 minutes of my day. And then there's obviously the the switching that comes with that. So I can't just come yeah. back and sit down and start working. So you've lost two hours on what is an unqualified prospect who just wanted to pick your brain and further their own, um, you know, agendas internally. Well, and the other, the other great thing about that though, is when you think about it is, okay, if you put that framework in place, then it frees you up to talk to those people who you really want to talk exactly. to because you know, see, it's that certainty, right? Like, I know that when someone that wants to work with me as a client and I've not worked with them yet, I send them that link. There's no decision involvement. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I know that's what happens. But if like, and I do this with the podcast guests too, like, uh, Austin Cleon is going to be on my podcast mm-hmm. in the near future. And I basically did like an ad hoc reach out on Twitter. It turns out that he, you know, he found it and we're, we're, we're arranging it. I did not send him my, Hey, here's the link to book a time on my show. Why? Cause I went after him. Mm-hmm. So 
Now we're meeting on a day at a time that's outside of that listening time. But that's OK, because that's a, that's an exception to the rule. And because I have the certainty of having that other thing in place, I know that I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, that's that's the starting point, right? That's the jumping off point. Everyone needs a jumping off point, because if you've got that, then you've got some place to work with. Again, think about improv again, right? Like when when you're doing improv and someone, you know, the, one of the first things they say is, can I have a suggestion from the audience, please? It, it gives them something to work with. Mm. And whenever you put a framework in place, it gives you something to work with. And if, if you've ever seen an improv show, any of you out there, and, and you're like, I expect this, if, if someone was to say, hey, give me a, a person, place, and thing, they're like, uh, I'm going to pick, uh, you know, uh, the, the Pope um, at, a, at a Burger King drive through uh, in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um you're probably going to you're probably knowing that you you, you have a, a preconceived notion of the way that's going to go, but you have no idea how that's going to go because he could be he could be ordering food. He could be working at the drive through like you don't know, but at least it gives you something to go with. Right. So you, you've got this preconceived notion when you're when you're seeing someone do an improv sketch, you're doing the same thing when you give yourself a framework. It's kind of like this ask for for yourself yeah. to say, hey, look, here's my link. I, this is this is going to jump through this hoop a little bit and then we'll see what happens or just here's the link. And I'm giving you this because I know that if you don't have this link, I'm going to take longer to get back to you because it's going to get buried in my email inbox, et cetera, et cetera. So it's yeah. all about just really it's about being considerate of both yourself and the other person's time. Mm hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it also avoids the whole back and forth around, yep. hey, here's the time I'm available. Oh, sorry, I can't do that time. What about this time? Oh, no, I can't do that either. How about this uh, time? And that those are the worst. can go on forever. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely terrible. But um, I mean, earlier in our conversation, Mike, you said that you're a bit of a, you would call yourself a product philosopher nowadays. And, um, you know, I've just read uh, Cal Newport's new book, Digital Minimalism, in which he says that what we need above all else is some sort of a philosophy when it comes to how we use our technology, our relationship relationship with our technology and he points to the the Amish and he says look the Amish aren't complete tech luddites they evaluate technology and determine whether or not it will actually further their purpose which is to strengthen the community and if they think it's not going to strengthen the community they won't pursue it so their tractors don't have tires on them because that way they can't go on roads but they can tend to the fields so in your case i mean do you have a philosophy when it comes to your use of technology yeah, actually, and Cal was on my show not too long ago. We, we actually talked a little bit about this. So my philosophy, like I try to uh, basically uh, tether my devices and, and my use for each device to kind of with my philosophy of time crafting. So uh, actually, this happened earlier today. Um, someone was saying, saying that uh, they'd read my uh, I read a, I sent a newsletter out where I said hey today's my listening day and they sent me a, a, a email back saying hey yeah you know what like I've been organizing my iPhone with like read write and uh, I think listen was the other one mm-hmm. and they said they put all their apps in there like that and they go what do you do I'm like actually I take it a step further I said all like if it's a mo- like all my my horizontal themes which are like making mode musing mode movement mode and uh, maintaining mode all of those apps live inside folders, but all of my apps that are related to the different days of the week based on daily themes are on different pages. So I have to like if I want to go to right. Sunday, Sunday's the home page, Monday's the you know. So I try to marry this up because I need I need to have those visual triggers to make sure that. I am paying attention. It's the same reason why I look around my office and I have, actually, I'm looking at it right now. I have a thing that I like to do every day. If I can do these five things every day, then the day is a success. And this is based on like just content creation and just living Mm -hmm. a good life. I I call it, I want to make waves every day, which means I want to write. I want to create some form of audio. That's the A. I want to create some form of video. I want to exercise and I want to socialize. If I can do all five of those, that's a baseline for a good day. It doesn't necessarily mean it was super productive, but I can end the day and go into tomorrow satisfied that, look, I wrote something. I made something for someone to listen to. I made something for someone to watch. Uh, I, you know, I kind of, uh, made the temple a little bit better by exercising. And then I filled my cup with, uh, hanging out with family and friends or even mm-hmm. just online. And I think that there's a lot of these little things that you can do that, that will allow you to be more deliberate with not just the, you know, the, the digital tech tools that we have, you know, like 
when I go into Facebook, I don't necessarily, I go into Facebook to share things very specifically from like, let's say, um, not buffer, but like I'll, I'll use extensions in my mm-hmm. iOS devices. And then when I'm ready to go actually scroll through Facebook, then I can do that. But when I share things, I don't go into Facebook at all. I use the extensions. I'll find a link. I'll share it that way. My avoidance for me is, is key because I do need those things. Um, but I do things like turning the notification. There's no notifications on my phone. Yeah. I, I'm very, I, I I'm very, very so, deliberate. <laughs> yeah, I'm very deliberate about that. But I mean, like there's lots of little baseline things. And you also need this from your physical goods too. Like there's lots of great physical pieces of technology out there and physical spaces. Like I have three very specific productivity zones in my office. Right now I'm sitting in my podcasting zone, which is mm-hmm. also podcasting and reading zone. Then I have a, a planning zone, which is where my and planning and writing zone. And then I have a coaching zone and a video zone, which is where I stand. Like, so yeah, it, you're, you know, a lot of people go, wow, he's really regimented, but it's not like I did that like in one fell swoop. It's evolved and manifested yeah. over time because I, if I don't do that, I know that I'll be looking at that bright, shiny object oh, yeah. or I'll be, you know, and, and so that I think Jocko and I would probably get along really, really well. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is about making those minor adjustments and then that cumulative benefit uh, basically compounds over time. And I, I found, you know, just simple hacks like replacing my phone as my alarm clock with an actual alarm clock, like an old school alarm clock. And that mm-hmm. way my phone is in another room when I go to sleep. It's not the last thing I look at before I sleep. It's not the first thing I look at in the morning. And it's definitely not something I reach for when I wake up at say three in the morning and Hey, let's just check social and see what's going on there. Because that just gives you so much more mental clarity. And it's so much easier to not do the thing just by changing your environment. Um, you know, I've been thinking about that too. Actually, as you mentioned that, like one of the things I've been thinking about is I use sleep cycle for my sleeping, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I've been using that. That's the one, the one benefit to sleep cycle is that it, because I'm a night owl, it wakes me up like it's a 30 minute window for wake up time. Right. So it won't, it, it'll either wait if I need to be up between seven thirty it might wake me up at 743 but the dangerous part like you said is that it's right there mm. right so I've, I've been i've just been waiting for an alarm clock to come along that has that built in mm-hmm. like motion sensors built in but it's just that like i have very it's interesting i have very specific devices that do one or two things very well as opposed to the smartphone which can do a lot of things you know, either well or reasonably well. And I think that's another great thing to mention is just because your phone and your iPad and your computer can do things and all these can do those things doesn't mean they need to. Yeah. Yeah. Could not agree more. And um, I mean, on sleep, you mentioned earlier that you are a bit of a, a night owl. And, you know, I recently read and as my, my audience will know that I'm a massive advocate now of uh, Matt Walker's work uh, on why we sleep. And, you know, he's a massive proponent of getting your eight hours sleep a night because seven hours sleep a night for say a whole week is equivalent to pulling an all-nighter and the effect on our cognition um, and our productivity as a result of that can suffer significantly. So what does your sleeping pattern look like, Mike? So there's, yeah, I spent a lot of time looking at this too because I am a night owl and, Mm. you know, there's lots of research around, um, you know, uh, I mean, Ariana Huffington's book aside, um, you know, Dr. Michael Bruce has written about it called The Power of When. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more about circadian rhythms. And that's what I tend to look at, too, because, you know, I'm wired to be a night owl. I've tried to get up early in the mornings. Yeah. I've tried segmented sleep. It just doesn't work. In fact, uh, funny story is I went to try a segmented sleep experiment. It wasn't working for me. I'm like, I wonder what other night owls do. And I found an article that someone had written and they, they were quoting this book that they had read. And I was losing my mind because I'm working on a book about being a night owl and being productive. And, uh, it turns out that it was my earlier version of that book that they had read. So I was learning from myself through someone else <laughs> to not fight my body clock. But I mean, I think that the research is, is interesting because I think that depending on the stage of life you're at, you know, I mean, some people are like the older you get, you're going to get naturally up a little bit earlier. I'm finding that mm-hmm. I am, I, I used to be able to stay up till two and it wasn't because I forced myself. It just was the way it was. Now I'm going to bed at around probably 12, 30, one o'clock. Wow. And then I'm getting up at around eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting about seven hours, but you know, uh, depending on who you talk to, it's six to eight hours. And I mean, I'm definitely not, I definitely, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go right down the middle and be reasonable and say no less than seven. Mm. But, uh, you know, I think that as and uh, as time goes on, I'm going to be doing like eight hours and, and so on and so forth. And, and the great thing is, is if I know I'm going to commit to at least seven hours, which means, like I said, 
bed at maybe midnight getting up at eight, um, then then that's the way it'll be. But I don't th- I can't see myself shifting to like the 10 p.m. bedtime or anything mm. like that anytime soon, because having that comedy background and stuff like that, like that was when you were on. Like yeah. that's when you did it. So I did that for so long that my body is kind of wired for that. And I can tell you that one of the reasons that I don't really suffer from tons of disruption or diversions during my day is because most of the stuff I'm doing during the day is not as, uh, you know, intensive as what I do once 10 o'clock hits because at 10 o'clock I'm going into like my writing and creative time because my wife's ready for bed. She's off to bed at that point. Um, you know, my kids are in bed and nobody's up bugging me. So I'm able to go, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to work on my book and I can sit there and write 1500 to 2000 words or more and not have to worry about anybody emailing me because I'm not going to get back to them anyway because it's, you know, after 10 at night. So mm-hmm. there are, uh, my argument's always been to the, to the whole miracle morning and I love how I love his work, but I don't think you need to do those savers at three 30 in the morning. I think you could do them at 10 in the morning and yeah. you do them whenever yeah. the, the, the idea we were actually on a panel once. It was me, Laura Vanderkam, who wrote what the most successful do before breakfast people do before breakfast, and Dan, and uh, Craig Jarrow, who's the time management ninja. And the the panel the the moderator said, uh, "What time do you guys do? Like, what time do you guys get your stuff done?" And uh, everyone said like uh, three thirty, five, seven. Like that's when I get my most important work done. And then he asked me, and I go, "I get it done the night before, so I'm ahead of them." Like I'm, I'm already, by the time I go to bed at one, I've already done the things that they're doing at three. So again, when you're a night owl, you have to, you have to gauge your schedule accordingly. And I think that there's, it's one of, it's an underserved uh, area of the population. It's underserved demographic because most people talk about like that there's this pull to be morning people. Mm. And not everyone's wired that way. And I mean, there are studies that say it's not necessarily healthy, but then there's others that like I read a study recently saying working out at night does not harm your sleep. Right. So, I mean, there's so much out there and that's what I'm spending my time on lately. Other than obviously working on the time crafting book, I'm working on this one in particular because I think this is a book that needs to be out there for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is about challenging what you hear as well. Um, I recently had Michael Shermer on the show and he alerted me to the fact that in the social sciences, there's a replication crisis where 50% of studies can't be replicated. Um, and these are foundational for teachings across different fields like psychology and, and law and politics and sociology and whatnot. So, and that's actual scientific studies. And then you have all these anecdotal stuff where people have published books about, you know, what the most successful people do before they have breakfast and, uh, you know, they're all up at 5 a.m. But then for every person who's up at 5 a.m. who's successful, you can find people like Tim Ferriss who doesn't wake up until after nine most days or Joe Rogan who you know he's in the comedy scene as well so most two or three nights a week he's at the comedy store in LA till two in the morning and then he'll get home and he'll write until about three or four and then he'll go to sleep but he's still dominating across a number of different um, areas so you know don't take what you hear as gospel and find out what works for you Um, in my case I've been getting up at 5 a.m. for years and more recently I've upped that until 6 a.m. and that's just because I found that Getting that extra hour of sleep, um, in terms of emotional regulation and being less irritable, has been, had a massive impact on me. And I found that, um, yeah, through conversations I had with uh, Brad Feld and Rand Fishkin, they they said the same thing, whereby they suffered bouts of depression. And what they did was, rather than wake up at five a.m. when their alarm clock went off, they wake up when their body says they're ready. Um, and that's made yes. all the difference for them as well. So. Uh, you know, it, it. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned. You know, I've moved it down to six. Whereas if it was a morning person, like, oh, down. You mean you're up at four? Like it just <laughs> it depends on the it depends on the perspective and the optics. But you're right. There was this there was this cachet, this kind of um, glamour to being the person that could pull the all nighter and get three four hours of sleep, and that's gone. And I'm glad yeah. it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's still people out there trumpeting that, like uh, our friend Jocko Willink, who does post a photo of his wristwatch every morning with four thirty four a.m. on it on his. <laughs> Instagram, but hey, uh, it is what it is. Uh, it is about whatever, taking whatever, it, whatever works, works for, you. for you, right? Taking yep, in as much yep. content as possible and determining what is right for you, not just what is right for the general population, because we are all different. Um, Mike, with the five minutes we have left, I'm going to throw you into our three question lightning round. Question number one If you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? I'd work for Costco, which Costco. I did. Yeah. What, why is that? And what, what stage? During the early days or once they were a big established conglomerate, essentially? Oh, I, I definitely. The, the early days would have been great. I mean, I was there from I was there uh, in 
so it was 90 i was there from 95 to or 96 to so it was it was like mid-year mid-cycle like it's been what 20 years since since mm-hmm. i've so but uh what i love about them is that their, their methodology is like very simple flexible and durable and, and i believe that that's that's such a, i was talking to michael gerber about it and he said you know mm-hmm. like this ultimate e-myth turnkey business is yeah. costco and they're one of the ones that's going to survive and in when we're seeing malls shut down and big retailers uh costco is going to be the one of the ones that continues to stand the test of time love it love it um question number two mike is if you could ask anyone a question that are alive who would it be and what would you ask I would probably ask, uh, I'd probably ask Einstein his thoughts on time as a construct. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just, you know, like what, how do you define time? Like what, what is your definition of time? Yeah. I'm sure he'd come back to you with a a physicist's answer, which would boggle the mind and have you going down the rabbit hole of physics for for days on end trying to figure out what he actually probably <laughs> yeah probably carlo ravelli has got the the order of time i think is the new book out and i've got that on my shelf and i'm almost afraid to open it yeah fantastic well <laughs> lucky i actually tried reading uh, astrophysics for people in a hurry and maybe uh i don't know may, maybe i'm just not maybe i'm walking too fast maybe i'm just in too much of a hurry that i still didn't understand what neil degrasse tyson <laughs> was talking about in that book but anyway um the lucky last question. I mean, we've kind of covered off on various aspects of this. So I always ask my guests what rituals or routines they have to stay on top of their game. Is there anything that you partake in on a daily basis that we haven't covered, Mike, that would be of interest to our listeners? Journaling. I journal Journaling. every single day. You mentioned you mentioned James Clear earlier on. And mm-hmm. when I talked to James on my podcast, uh, we, we discussed how journaling was one of those things he just couldn't get to stick until he developed the, the Clear Journal, the Clear Habits Journal with Baron Fig and the one sentence journal entry. And I think that it's one of those things that I do and I basically marry it to my daily theme. So, hey, you know, did I live up to my daily theme today? Mm-hmm. First off, what was it? If, if so, yes. If not, why not? Um, what I love about journaling is it's personal. You can mm-hmm. make it as 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 you know ruthless as possible. You know, like hey, bullet points of everything you did. You could make it as reasonable as you want, which is more like you know uh, one sentence. You can make it as emotional as you want. But what the great thing about journaling, for productivity's sake, is that you can look back day by day by day cumulatively and see you know have I gone off course? What have I accomplished? You get that anecdotal stuff mm-hmm. versus just looking at your calendar and to do list and getting that that quantitative stuff. You're getting more of a qualitative story of your life and the narrative that you're that you're telling yourself uh daily may not be the actual narrative that you're living so uh, yeah. journaling is one of those things that i make time for every single night perfect perfect and uh, one of the big benefits uh, of journaling for me is just brain dumping and getting whatever thoughts are mm-hmm. you know, rever- reverberating between your ears onto paper and it just makes it much easier to fall asleep Helps you sleep. Helps you sleep. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. All righty. Well, we are just about out of time, Mike. It has been an absolute pleasure. But if our audience want to learn more about you and your work, check out your coaching, your workshops, your online tools, they can visit productivityus.com. Um, is there anything in particular you'd like to share with them aside from that? Yeah, actually, go to productivityus.com slash Glaveski, and then mm-hmm. I'll have some special stuff there for everybody. How's that Fantastic. sound? Fantastic. That sounds great. We'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. Thanks again, Mike. I hope you enjoy the uh, 11 degrees Celsius weather in BC, Canada. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Really appreciate it. I hope your listeners got a lot of value out of this. Hi, guys. Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe, and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gleveski and on Instagram at TheSteveGleveski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.